I am really excited to have you. I can't wait to hear your story. You have been an inspiration just to see how open you have been with your struggles and your mental health. I then saw that you were just making people's dreams come true. What a great thing to do. Like, how do you even get to that point where you just do that? That's amazing. So I just want you to tell me a little bit about how you came to that point and what made you open up in the first place about your mental health and your struggles? Well, I realized that if I, if I'm open and honest about what I'm going through, um, some people, they call it vulnerability. I don't really think it's vulnerability because when I looked up the definition of vulnerability, it says likely to be preyed on. And I'm like, that's not what being open is. It's, it, it, it doesn't make you weak. It makes you stronger. But it really helps other people if you get through it because now they have proof. They have proof of somebody who was trying mm -hmm. and then that person got through it. And that is what is that just a hand that's reached back to somebody and lifts them up even when you're not there. When I was young, I was a I was a dreamer, but I, I struggled with uh, social anxiety. I was just afraid. I was afraid of anything that dealt with like going out into the world. In high school, I never went to a um, house party or a football game. I just didn't know how to do it. So I needed something that can allow me to interact with the world. And sometimes your weakness can become what makes you really strong. And I decided I want to be a businessman. I wanted to become a businessman because I wanted to interact with people. And that was it. And so if I had a business, I can interact with people and I can feel confident about that. But that actually was the backup plan because my original dream, I wanted to be an athlete, but I was always overweight and I couldn't figure it out. I was always morbidly obese, even as a kid. And so I buried that dream. I became a businessman and I got really good at it and it gave me a place in this world. And I went to my mom. Um, I grew up in Atlanta and I went to my mom and I said, I want to put a recording studio in my bedroom. And I said, hip hop is the future. And she was like, I don't know about that hip hop stuff. <laughs> Were you into music before that? Well, or was be, just like a... Well, being in Atlanta, it's just kind of like out here in LA, it's like acting. Okay. Atlanta, it's about rapping. That's it. Like everybody <laughs> raps, everybody produces. And if you don't rap or produce, you're a party promoter. So it was just like this whole world. And I wanted to be a part of it. Like in high school, my friends started rapping. And so I wanted the studio. Next thing you know, I have a studio and there's like 50 people in the house after school. And I built a website. It was like a media outlet. And I wanted to feature all these independent artists. Next thing you know, the website's blowing up. I'm not making any money, but it's like popular. And it came to the point in time where I need to go to college because my mom said, if I don't go to college, I got to pay rent. So I'm like, I need to go to college because I'm putting all my money into my business. And I'm in school. And one day I got a phone call from a guy named uh, Brian Washington. And he's uh, the head of A&R at Interscope Records. And like I had never gotten a phone call from a record label before. So this was pretty awesome. And I'm standing on campus and he said, we just signed this artist. His name is Soldier Boy. And Soldier Boy wants you to be his cameraman. And I said, I said, Mr. Washington, like, I would love to. He said he wants you to go on tour with him. I said, absolutely, I'm there. But then I had to, like, remember that I had to ask my mom if I could drop <laughs> out of school. So I said, Mr. Washington, like, I need to talk to my mom. I need to get her permission. He said, how old are you? I said, I'm 18. <laughs> he said, okay, ask your mom. And uh, I went to my mom's house. She gave me her blessing. Next thing you know, I'm on tour with Soldier Boy, going all over the world. and. Um, I got fired and I learned a really important lesson that stuck with me. I got fired in a really unique way. We were supposed to go to the Jimmy Kimmel show. We're in Atlanta. I know that we're flying out tomorrow morning, but I didn't get the itinerary. Nobody's answering my calls and I'm blowing everybody up. I'm like waiting for my itinerary, waiting for my flight, all that. And so I just go to the airport the next morning thinking I'll bump into everybody because we travel every day. Mm -hmm. They ghosted you? After, yeah, <laughs> I got ghosted. After about three hours of standing in the airport, I realized I, th I think I'm fired. Um, That's crazy. It hurt. It sucked. But I, 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 I learned something. I learned how to flip my mind really quickly. 
And I said to myself, this is a winning streak because the cameraman is the least paid person on the team. And the manager is the highest paid person on the team. And when I'm taking that bus ride home to my mom's house and I walk in her front door, she said, what are you doing here? I said, I think I'm fired. She said, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, no, this is the best thing that ever happened to me. She said, what do you mean? I said, I'm about to be rich because I'm going to be a manager now. Oh, God. They forced me into my greatness. If I stayed the cameraman, I would have just stayed the cameraman. It's hard walking away from being a big artist cameraman. But they forced it. So now I'm a managed artist. And she said, you seem awfully confident. I said, I'm going to be the best. And I just looked at it as a win. Yeah, that's a, that's a way to see things. That's, that's a great way to see things. And everything bad that's ever happened in my life has been like that. And so it gave me momentum. When you look for the wins, you get this um, uh, uh, confidence. You get this ability to see blessings. When you're looking at things that are going wrong, which are normal, because we're humans, and humans were designed to look for things that are attacking us. Like if we're cavemen, we got to protect ourselves. But, you know, if we're in fear, it's very hard to see a blessing. So once I switch, to this, now I can see opportunity. So I went and I signed this girl group, my first group, and I, I got them a record deal. And then they fired me. And so I was right back to my mom's basement six months later. And she said, are you okay? I said, yes, this is a winning streak. She said, please explain. I said, well, everything with this group was friction. Everything. I would have to travel two hours a day to pick them up on the north side of Atlanta. Then I drive to the other one and pick them up. Then drive to the south side of Atlanta to take them to dance practice and take them to the east side of Atlanta. And it was taking a toll on me. Like I was in the car for eight hours a day. And my car was breaking down. I had a 1986 Plymouth Reliant K car. And the radiator went out. The transmission went out. It's just everything was wrong. And I told her, even the parents, they were frustrated. Everybody was frustrated. There was just nothing good. And I said, this is a blessing because there was nothing about that that was good. They are doing me a favor by firing me. And I signed a guy group. And it was frictionless. Everything was perfect. My car didn't break down. I'm just like, oh, this is what it should feel like. We started taking off and they never fired me. And that group was called Travis Porter. Uh, do you know Travis Porter? I oh, believe so. Okay, now, ladies. <laughs> he knows Travis Porter. <laughs> so, so Travis Porter, we made a lot of just like dance music back in like 2008, 2009, 2010. And um, we took off. And I signed an artist named Two Chains and took off. And everything in my life was just effortless. And it was all those bad things that were blessings. But I didn't realize I was coming into the biggest storm of my life. I didn't sail off into the sunset. Yeah, I made lots of money and I was successful at an extremely young age. At the time, I'm maybe 24, 25, and I've got number one artist, number one songs in the world. But I got diagnosed with a brain tumor. At 24, 25? At 27. 27, okay. Mm -hmm. We wow. had just won a Grammy which is not easy to do for hip-hop, you know, artists. Um, at the time, hip-hop artists didn't win many Grammys. And I thought, wow, like, this is what being on top of the world should feel like. But I was as sick as I ever was. And I was tested, my, my faith, of how am I going to find the good in this situation? Because I'm thinking I'm at the end of my life. And I had to try really hard to find the win in it. And there was a blessing that came from it. It was my dream. Rock bottom will show you your roots. It will take you so deep that you'll start remembering things you just can't remember if you're above ground. I went so deep and I remembered 
what my original dream was. And it was to be an athlete. And once I remembered and I saw it and I would close my eyes and I would see all these visions of my dream coming true. But then my reality kicks in. It's like my heart wants to say one thing. And then my head is like, Charlie, you're 28 years old. You're 300 pounds. You have a brain tumor. How would you ever make a living being an athlete? Like, that dream is stupid. What do you mean you're going to be an athlete? But I had to listen to my heart. And what did I do? I left my music business. I left my $15 million a year. And I walked away to chase my dream. And I wanted to reinvent my life. I wanted a rebirth. I left my city. I left my family. I left my business. I left social media. I left everything. And I went to chase my dream. And what happened over the course of the next year and a half was miraculous. And that brain tumor became the greatest blessing in my life because I became extremely magical. I was able to manifest anything I wanted. I wanted to be a Nike athlete. That's what I wanted, even as a kid. My first stock that I ever bought, I was like a little, like, I, I used to save up my money and buy stocks. I bought Nike at age eight. I loved Nike. It was inspirational for me. I was like, I want to be a Nike athlete. I wanted to make a fan-made Nike commercial. So Nike would see it, and Nike would sign me. And then I'd be in commercials with LeBron James and Serena Williams. These are the conversations I'm having with myself. When I tell other people, they said, Charlie, you're Delulu. You're crazy. I said, I know. But I see it when I close my eyes. They said, Charlie, we know you have a brain tumor and everything, but are you like mentally okay? I said, I'm mentally fine. This is my dream. And it's going to come true. I wanted to make a fan-made Nike commercial. So I started calling all my friends in Hollywood who were filmmakers. And they said, all right, Charlie, what do you want to do? I was like, Nike grade commercial. They're like, all right, you're going to need a budget of about 60000 I was like, hmm not paying all that for an Instagram video. I was like, I'm just going to post this on Instagram. They're like, well, what do you want? I was like, Nike Gray commercial. They said, Charlie, you're going to need somebody who shoots, who edits, who owns all the equipment, who owns the anamorphic and cinematic lenses. You're going to need somebody who color grades. You're going to need somebody who scores. And you're going to need somebody who uh, makes the Hans Zimmer type music. I said, okay, I'll find them. I'm sitting on my couch in Santa Monica. I'm writing in my notebook. Today is the day I searched and found my videographer slash editor. It's done, exclamation mark. It's easy, exclamation mark. My roommate walks through the front door. He's an accountant at a goji berry company that sells goji berries to Whole Foods. Behind him is a guy holding a big steady cam rig with all this equipment on top of it. I'm thinking to myself, does my roommate who works for a goji bear company have a big old camera crew following him? I said, Morgan, what are you doing? He said, well, like, uh, my friend, you know, uh, Manny called and he's shooting this thing for his Airbnb company. So he sent this camera crew over. And so I'm sitting there thinking, like, I just wrote in my notebook. So I talked to the guy who's holding the camera. I said, you make videos? And the first words out of his mouth were so depressing. I was like, oh, God. I was like, do you do videos? He's like, yeah, I do videos, but nobody ever pays me. I was like, oh, God, he sounds like a dark cloud. I was like, um, can I see some of your work? He said, yeah, I got, I got my website. I haven't updated it in like six years, but like you can see it if you want to. He was like gothic, wore all black, and I'm just like very colorful and light, and I'm like dreaming. So I was like, this can't be my guy, but I open my laptop. I click on a short film that he made. I said, this is real really good. Did you shoot this? He said, yeah, I shot it. I said, who edited it? He said, well, I edited it too. I said, who owned all the equipment? He said, well, like, I'm kind of like a hoarder. So like, uh, like anytime I make any money, I just buy equipment. I have lighting. I have steady cam rigs. I have dollies. I have cranes. I was like, really? I said, who made the music? Because the person who shoots never makes music. He said, well, I used to be in a rock band and we were on the Warp Tour and we had a record deal, but the record label dropped us. I said, so you made all the music. He said, who, I said, who did the scoring? He said, well, I did like, you know, like I used like, you know, flip flops and different sounds. And 
I was like, who did the color grading? He said, um, well, like I taught myself Da Vinci and I did. I was like, oh, my God. I said, look at my notebook. I wrote down that I was going to find you today and you walked in my front door. I said, I want to be a Nike athlete. We're going to make a fan-made Nike commercial together and Nike's going to see it. Nike's going to want to sign me and my dream's going to come true. He said, you're crazy. I said, I know, but it's going to happen. We sat down at a vegan burger restaurant and I told him my idea. And I said, how much will it cost to make this? He said, $600. I said, why? Because now I'm skeptical. I'm like, why 600 He said, well, I need to rent one lens. I need to get a PVC pipe that's 10 feet long. I need two belts. I'm going to tie one belt around you, another belt around me. I need a skateboard. And um, that's it. I was like, excuse me? Can I show you what we made? Yeah, for sure. All right, I'm going to pull it up. I pretty much had everything you can imagine in life. Million dollar businesses, world tours, number one albums. We even won a Grammy. I left it all. When I was eight, I had this dream. But as you get older, society tells you what's realistic. You see, I wanted to be an athlete, but I was a chubby kid. It didn't matter to society what I was passionate about. It only mattered what I could realistically accomplish. I had everything anyone could ever dream of. But the bigger my business got, the more I buried my dream. And one day, I cracked. I became over 300 pounds. I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Despite everything going wrong, the most amazing people walked into my life at the right time. But in the end, I had to figure it out by myself. When you're broken, all you have left is your truth. I left my company, my friends, my city. I reinvented my entire life. I had to go back to that eight-year-old dream of mine. I will be an athlete. My story isn't over yet. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. This is so good. Thank you. Did you come up with the whole idea of it? Or is it like a mix between you two? I was good at storytelling. He was good at um, filmmaking and he made the music he was so talented and it was divine this wasn't me and it wasn't him he walked into my front door after I wrote down that I was going to find him when we were shooting that remember when I handed the glasses to the little kid mm -hmm. I was on the Santa Monica Pier and I was, I was needing a kid for this scene to kind of resemble the uh, inner child so this inner child is going to hand me these glasses and we're going to run to the finish line together. So I found this kid and I asked his father, I said, can I use you for like 30 seconds? Real simple scene. He said, sure. I asked the kid what his name was, Charlie. It just, when you chase the dream, you get all the signs. I left a, a music empire to do something that was true. And that's why the brain tumor was so amazing, because I got to experience so many blessings so that if anybody's dealing with something wrong, just disarm it and go ahead and give it permission to be a blessing. Because when I put out that video, I had 10,000 followers on Instagram. I put it out. Three days later, my phone rings. And the caller ID says Beaverton, Oregon. And there's only one company in Beaverton, Oregon. And it's Nike. And my jaw was on the ground. I said, it's happening. 
it really is happening. I answer the phone, and there was a gentleman by the name of Andy Miguel. He said, is this Charlie? I said, yes. He said, I don't know who you are, but somehow you managed to get our entire campus in a frenzy fighting over who's going to bring you here first. I'm in a dream because uh, it's just a dream. I get on campus. They walk me into a conference room with all the executives. And they said, we are changing the direction of our company because of this film. We forgot about dreams. He said, we got something big planned. And what they did was they created the biggest Nike commercial of all time. It was the Colin Kaepernick commercial. And it had me, LeBron James, Serena Williams, Colin Kaepernick. We won an Emmy, and the stock price went up $26 billion. Oh, wow. And Nike signed over 200 other Dreamer athletes like myself. People who had problems, people who had interesting stories, people who were not dealt a good hand. That was all the proof I needed that manifestation is real, but it's, I don't even, manifestation is, is, a, is a beautiful word, but I don't even know if that's the word I would use because it's really what manifestation truly is or what I truly did was I just believed it was already mine long before anybody could see it. It was kind of like a um, a radio and a song. Because right now in the air, there are songs flying past us. But we can't hear them and we can't see them. But they're there. Then you have a radio. And when it's tuned to the right frequency, it takes this thing that doesn't exist, but it does because it's there. And it plays a beautiful song. It pulls it out of the air and it plays it. And all we had to do was tuned to the frequency. If we're on the wrong station, all we get is static. When we don't believe, we're getting static. When we do believe, we start seeing. Some people say, if I see it, I'll believe it. But I think it's the other way around. I believe it, and then I'll see it. I dedicated my life to uh, making other people's dreams come true, and since that moment, I've made 1,500 people's dreams come true. Little kids with cancer and just people who are struggling, homeless or single mothers or kids with disabilities. And What happened with your tumor? Well, when I left the music industry, I completely rebirthed my life. I removed everything. I removed my city, my business, TV, social media, and I started over with food. And I asked myself one question. If you are what you eat, is what I'm eating dead or alive? And so I started looking at food as dead or alive. Um, a cliff bar, it could sit on the shelf for nine years. Well, like it's pretty dead, you know, and then an orange or, you know, or broccoli or whatever. It's alive. So I, I changed everything. I became plant based, I became very alkaline, and my body started healing. I was able to do amazing things. I did an Ironman in New Zealand. I rode my bicycle from L.A. to New York. Oh, wow. I reversed my brain tumor. I did six marathons. I lost 130 pounds. And I just became very, very electric. The electricity that comes from food, the electricity that comes from peace and less stress, it, it, it healed me. I healed in so many ways. And so um, my brain tumor was inoperable. It was wrapped around my eye. It was wrapped around the artery that goes into my brain. And it was um, there for so long, it started corroding the top of my spine. And when I cleaned up everything in my life, it shrunk. I still have it, but it's under control now. And it made me realize how important our food is, but also our environment and our thoughts. And so what I did to work on my thoughts was to be on a winning streak. And I would start my winning streak every morning. I had to start. And I would always start it at Starbucks. Okay? So I go to Starbucks. And a latte costs like five bucks. But what are the ingredients of a latte? It's two espresso shots, some almond milk, and like maybe some sugar, maybe not. That's five bucks. 
So what I did one morning when I went to Starbucks, I said, give me a double shot of espresso with just a splash of almond milk. So it's pretty much a latte. It's, a, it's just less almond milk. They said that'll be $2.47. I said, I'm getting a latte for half the price? This is great. I'm on a winning streak. So then I started my winning streak. And then I'm brainwashing myself into thinking I'm actually winning. Because when I catch the green light, I'm like, I'm on a winning streak. And I go to the grocery store and I get the good parking spot. And then I like back into it. I'm like, let me give the parking spot a little extra love because I'm on a winning streak. And then I catch the red light and I'm like, oh, now I can look at my phone, you know, because I don't look at my phone when I'm driving. So red light's a blessing. And then like I just look at the the beautiful sun or just anything like my mom answered the phone. Like that's a blessing. That's a winning streak. So I do this practice where I find all the wins and I started believing I was a winner. And when you believe you're a winner, you like attract things. It's like, have you ever been to Las Vegas? Yeah. Have you ever been with friends? No. Well, just imagine this scenario. Let's say you're in Las Vegas and you have a friend that's winning like like every every game. Everybody's like coming around them and like everybody's cheering, right? Everybody wants to be around a winner. It's very attractive. But then you have somebody who's losing every game. It's like the opposite of attractive. It's like just sending people away. They're miserable. They're sad. But winning, to me, had to start as a choice. Because the fact is, there's a lot of shit going on in each and every one of our lives. But there's a lot of good stuff, too. I just needed to brainwash myself and only look at the wins. And I became very attractive. And blessings just came and came. And so I kept the winning streak going. And then it became addictive. Because negative thoughts are addictive too. Probably more addictive. Um, Gossip, negativity, fear. That stuff's addictive. But when you start feeling really, really, really good, it becomes addictive as well. So um, I just started my winning streak. And I was like, I got to keep this going every day. And if something bad happens, it's still a win. I disarm it. I thank it. And I'm like, okay, Santa Claus delivers presents in the dark. So if something bad is happening, it's dark. So I know there's a present somewhere. So like I just like always tell myself something good is going to happen from anything bad. And I got proof of that now in my life. And uh, yeah, reverse the brain tumor to answer the question. Got really healthy and just dedicated my life to helping other people. I'm like just shocked by your story. It's it's really inspiring. I need I need like a second to take your time. <laughs> I'm also getting my little remember what we talked about? Anxiety. So I have this thing. Okay. And when I get really anxious, I get like anxiety attack kind of thing. Okay. And I start feeling like nauseous and just like sweating. I'm literally like sweating. And what did I do to give you anxiety? No, it's not. It's on (laughs) you. It's, I don't know. And I told Jake, I was like, this might happen. I was nervous about it. So that's why I'm. It's Sorry, okay. if I haven't been talking to. I'm just listening because I'm. No, it's okay. That's a. I'm, I'm not sure what to do. I'm, I'm literally, like sweating. I don't know. I got something that'll make you happy. <laughs> Once upon a coconut. <laughs> Want to open the door? Is it open? It's happening. Really? Yeah. Uh oh. Well, we could take a break. Okay. Just know there's no pressure with me. Oh, I know it's happening because I need to throw up now. Man, I hope she's okay. She's been looking to this podcast. And you're the perfect show for her. It's just, it's not as simple as you think. There's anything I could do to make it easier. You know sure, no, I need. You okay? 
I'm not great, but. So there's this thing. Okay, so something would always happen mm -hmm. since I was younger that I would, like, I would just all of a sudden start feeling sick or I was just not feeling well, and I never knew what it was. Mm -hmm. And then it would be usually, like, times where I would put too much pressure on myself or if I was nervous, like, one time I was going to meet an ex's family and then my mom literally had to come pick me up because I was so nervous that I started throwing up. I didn't feel well. Or in runways, I would like get really sick and not just not feel great. I would have to go home. I never knew what it was. And I like went to a doctor to get it checked and it was nothing. And then when I started the pageant, it started getting so much worse. The headaches, like, cause it starts, like I'm sitting here with you and then I'm just like disassociating. And then start sweating because I'm trying to pretend that I'm normal. So I start sweating more because I get more nervous. Then my hands get cold. And then it just gets to a point that I can't keep pretending. Mm -hmm. And I just need to either throw up or lay down. But when the pageant started, it was a lot worse. And so they took me to the doctor and my headaches were really bad. And they even like injected something in the back of, the, like mm -hmm. in the back of my head because they said it was tension or something. Mm -hmm. um, which it got better for just a little bit. Like it has been going on, but then in my head, I'm just like, oh, maybe I'm just pushing myself or it's just, I suffer from migraines. I get prescribed migraine meds. And I was coming from Texas right now, like a few days ago. And I started getting the headache and I was like, this is weird. Like nothing is happening. And I had the headache for three days. And I realized that it was because I was coming to LA and I was just nervous, um, overwhelmed with everything that's going on. I had a lot of things to do. And I looked it up, anxiety, like anxiety attacks, and it described every single thing that I would get. So I'm like, is this, I don't know. But I was literally just talking to Jake and I'm like, it's going to happen because it just happens when I put too much pressure on myself. And so here we are. So I think that's what it is. Because then I wouldn't know what else it is if I'm just like sitting here. Then all of a sudden I just get sick and yeah. Well, I give you that's full permission not to have any pressure with me. Thank you. I know. It's it's not even... I tried... Ugh. I just... Am I going to be throwing up? Or... Well, it's all right. It's all right. I'm proud of you. You're doing it. <laughs> and this is actually going to be very helpful for somebody watching. You don't want this, but the fact that you're honest about it and they got to witness it is going to help somebody know that they're not alone. And... uh the community you're going to build is probably going to really heal all of y'all. So all this Thank is a blessing. You. That happened for a reason. It's good. Manifest good things. <laughs> Just trying to see things in a different way. I had so many questions, but then I, I felt like if I would say something, I was going to throw up. So I just kept listening. It's um, all good. I could pick up where I left off. Please. All right. But, okay, but if I just, whatever I do, just don't take it personal. <laughs> I won't. I promise. Okay. So after the Nike commercial, I made a promise to myself and to God that I'm going to reach out and reach my hand back and get other people out of a dark place. And I started with one person. Uh, I actually was biking across America, and I just wanted to help somebody who was in need. And there was this teacher. She was Hispanic. She had breast cancer and her car was broken and she was behind on her mortgage. This is when I learned that I didn't have to be Superman. I just needed to try to find the answer because she had problems bigger than I could afford. But I just tried to make some phone calls and I used my little platform and I found this guy who ended up paying off her mortgage, bought her a car, billionaire guy. And that's when I learned that philanthropy doesn't have to be me giving money to people. It could be me just trying. Like, here's somebody who needs help. Let me just try to fight for you because it might be too difficult for them. That was the very first dream I did. I just went around the country. I met a little girl. She had a very rare disease called CRPS. And I asked her what her dream was. And she said, I want to be a baker. I was like, well, let's bake some cookies. And we're baking cookies together. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, her disease is going to cost her a lot of money for the rest of her life. She needs a business. Like these cookies, her dream can be the thing that helps her the most, just like mine did. So in 12 days, I built her a cookie business. Oh, wow. And we launched her website. 
And in two days, she sold five hundred thousand dollars worth of cookies. Our fan base just rallied and how long ago was this? This was about a year and a half ago. And since then we've helped kids with their clothing lines and we've made hundreds of thousands of dollars and we've helped homeless artists sell paintings and Oprah and Steve Harvey and all these amazing people bought paintings from them. We've helped lots of kids with cancer and disabilities. And I just wake up every day and I'm trying to build a movement to just get people out of a dark place. I have a goal. I want to make a million dreams come true. And uh, I realize it's going to take a lot of money to do that. And so that's why I started Once Upon a Coconut, because I was like, I want to build a beverage brand that can make billions of dollars. And then that's how we can fund making millions of dreams come true. And so I appreciate you supporting it. And um, your cases are in the mail right now. <laughs> but yeah, so i um, really excited about the future. I'm still dreaming, still manifesting every day. I write in my notebook and um, I just try to be there for my friends. I try to be there as much as possible. I had a friend call me yesterday. He was He was suicidal. Not too long ago, he had a gun in his hand ready to, and uh, I just talked to him. And, uh, we turned it around. He texted me today, and uh, he's doing good. He's doing good, so we're going to keep him on that winning streak. So I, uh, now that I'm in your life, you can call me, too, <laughs> if you ever need me. Okay. I'll, okay. You got my number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> White coconut. So it's really healthy, and I care about health. Okay. So, like, there's not many things that taste good that are healthy. And uh, coconut water, we're innovating upon it. We have... You know, the pineapple one, we got the blueberry coming out. We got the watermelon. So all just coconut. We got the coconut coffee coming out. So <laughs> coconut water is just really good for you. It's really hydrating. Okay. Um, it's got all the natural electrolytes in just one ingredient. It's just coconut water. So it's um, it's really good. So we wanted to attack the market in a very boring industry, which is coconut water industry. is <laughs> very boring, um, but it's it's the healthiest for you from anything that, like, tastes good. I think since I saw it, I was always wondering, I was like, how did you- yeah. Yeah, it's it's been a blessing. It's been a blessing for our mission and for our foundation. So we're growing it every day. I have a goal to make it the, the biggest, most impact driven beverage in the world. In the let's world. let's make it happen. Yeah. Let's do it. I can't okay. wait. You send different flavors or just one flavor? Three different flavors. Which ones? Got the chocolate, got the original, and got the pineapple. Ooh, okay. The chocolate is fire. It's crazy. Wait, I think I saw didn't you you just post a reel with this guy that you were at the mm-hmm. Santa Monica Pier, mm-hmm. and then you were like, $2 if you don't like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I saw his reaction. Mm-hmm. It was really funny. Oh, my God, you have to watch that video. There's a lot of people who don't like coconut water. And so what I do is I specialize in those people because ours tastes totally different than normal coconut water. Okay, I can't wait. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, just out here dreaming, <laughs> trying to make it happen. Um, What would you say was your lowest or darkest time throughout your whole entire journey? There were some really dark times around my health. It was my, like, physical health, but, like, my mental. I was so freaking lost. I was was addicted to food. I was a binge eater. So there were just, like, these really dark moments where I would go from gas station to gas station, and I would just buy pastries, and I would eat in, like, a one-hour period, like, 15,000 calories. And I would, like, do it in a way that, I would try to make myself so sick, so I'd never want to do it again. It's kind of like a, a drug. Like, I wanted to overdose mm-hmm. so that I would be sick, and then that would give me the strength to not want to do it. And I would always say, this is my last time doing this. This is my last time doing this. And there was this one time, it was kind of like, it was kind of sad. It was, I, I went through the Wendy's drive through and I would go every day. And the lady who's at the drive through she becomes your friend. You know, you see her every day. And she's a big lady. She told me, she said, you need to stop coming here. You're out of control. And to have the the lady at the Wendy's tell you that, like, hurt me. And I said, like, my knee-jerk reaction was like, who are you to tell me? Like, And she said, you're going to kill yourself. Oh, wow. She would see what I would order. And so I was taken back. I had all these Baconators and Frosties and stuff in my car. And I pulled over into the parking spot. And I would always eat in my car. It was like my little hiding place. And my best friend who lived with me, she called me. She said, Charlie, where are you at? I said, oh, I'm at the studio. And she said, okay, I'm on my way home. I'm sitting there in the car. And like five minutes later, I see a black Dodge Charger pull into the Wendy's parking lot. She drives black Dodge Charger. 
but this is Atlanta. There's a lot of black Dodge Chargers, so I'm like, oh, it's not her. And then this car pulls up right beside my car. I'm like, stuff in my face. And she knows I'm supposed to be on a diet. Like, everybody knows. Everybody's concerned for my health. Like, I'm morbidly obese. She rolls down the window, and she looks at me. And it was just like one of those, like, gut check moments. And she's just like, you got to get control of yourself. And I just couldn't ever figure it out. Like, business was really tough because stress would lead to food. Success would lead to food. Business meetings would always be based around food. Everything was around food. And I was just so addicted, like it was a drug. That's why it was important for me to change my environment completely. I had to change everything. It was all the triggers, all the programming. I needed to become a new person. This wasn't working for me anymore. And all I wanted was just to have control of my thoughts because it, 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 it controlled me. It was like uh, I was, I could eat so much but never get full, ever. Like I can eat 25 cookies, seven hamburgers, and three Frosties, and there's something that happens in the brain where it just doesn't get full. It just craves more, more, and more, even though my stomach's full. And so I changed everything, and it worked. I took a big leap. I changed everything, and it worked. And I recommend that to people. Don't stay in a bad situation. There's something that's causing this, and it's us. You can't just run away from it. You have to face it. But when I ran away, I actually did the work. I studied. I watched the documentaries. I read, and I made my actions my dream. So I healed, you know. How would you say your mental health is right now with, I don't know, just everything? It's the best that's ever been in my life. Oh, that's good to hear. I figured a lot out. I uh, re-struggled with my weight even after that. Um, after losing all the weight, when I started my foundation, my weight started to go back up. But I couldn't figure out why. Because I was eating healthy. I was eating the same way I was eating when I lost the weight. It's just the difference here is I'm in a high-stress environment making people's dreams come true. It's, it's not easy. But back in April, I faced a really bad situation. My foundation was um, running out of money, and I had to let go of 90% of our staff. And it was just dark times. You, you know me. I was like, this is going to be a blessing. And I just doubled down on myself, and I got focused. I said, I'm not going to go outside. I'm going to save money. I'm going to do the work. I'm going to get focused. I'm going to wake up early. I'm going to listen to my motivational stuff. And I'm going to do everybody's job myself. And I'm going to do it. And I got extremely just intensely focused. And I actually figured out my health in the midst of that. And um, right now, I'm in the best place I've been. Probably ever in my life. I've lost 30 pounds. I got 30 more to go. Business is good. Dreams are going good. And my mental health is nice and stable. I. Uh, I moved out to a very naturous part of uh, California and I go in nature and I just like made sure I got really focused and mm-hmm. removed all distractions and it's it's really paid off. I like, I mean, I don't know if I would like, if I will be able to put it in practice right away, but I do like when you say if something bad happens, just to see it as a blessing. I want to think that I can think like that. I don't know if I can just because my negative thoughts fully attack my head and everything's bad but it would be so nice like right now with well just the past few months that I've been struggling Mm -hmm. I'm starting the podcast and for some reason I've tried to stay and I say for some reason just because it usually doesn't happen like this but I've tried to stay really positive and I'm like it's it's gonna happen like if anyone tells me something negative I like I doubt myself so much but I'm like I for that's why I'm like for some reason I still have everything's happening for a reason and if the last three months didn't happen like how they did, I wouldn't have started the podcast. So I'm like, yeah, it has been really tough. I've been in a really dark place. But because of that is that I'm like, okay, what am I going to do with my life now? I, you know, like I want to do this. I want to, there's so many other, there's so many other things that I want to do that maybe now is time because for some reason that that was just taken away from me. So maybe this is time for the podcast. You remind me of a friend of mine. She was almost saying the same exact things you said. And this was a couple of years ago. Her name is Ashley. She's down in Florida. I'd love to connect you with her. Almost identical to where life almost was paralyzing. 
she is thriving. So, and I, I had hope for her, but it was hard to find the hope. <laughs> it was hard. She is thriving so much now. I don't even know who she is. Mm. It's a totally different person. But her thing, she just had to find the thing she was going to be great at. And it gave her the confidence and it healed her. Maybe for you, it's the podcast. For her, it was the gym. She wanted to become a bodybuilder. I was oh, like, wow. I was like, okay. <laughs> it healed her. She became so confident. Now she's living the life of her dreams. But the conversations we used to have were just, and she was so paralyzed by life. But it is possible. And if it's this podcast, dominate. Go attack. You can do it. Put it out there and just keep doubling down on it. And you never know. It might be the thing that just heals everything. Yeah. Sometimes it's an outside thing. Sometimes it's not internal. People always just tell me because I used to never know what like self love was. It's very self sabotaging previously. And they said, You gotta find the self love within. I didn't find self love within. I was in a relationship with a girl. She loved me so freaking much. I actually started believing it. I actually started believing I was amazing. I got it from somebody else. Sometimes it might be something external. Go all in. Don't play around with this. Go all in. Dominate. It's going to help a lot of people. The more this helps other people, the more it'll heal you. I guarantee yeah, you this episode. Sure. If anybody's watching what you just dealt with, it's going to help you. And you're going to wake up and you're going to fight through it. And they're going to watch you transform in real time. And it's going to help a lot of people. You can do it. Thank you. <laughs> like, that's my main goal. You just said, like, in real time, and that's why I'm like, if anyone's struggling, I just want them to join me on this journey because I'm struggling right now. And, like, every time, if I am able to put an episode out there, it's like, there was so much behind it. Like, I struggled a lot, but I did it. Like, every time there is an episode out there, it means I accomplished something. That's why someone else can do that. So it's like we're doing it together. Mm -hmm. But then this thing happens where I just get my anxiety, whatever attack I don't even know what to call it and then it's like but what if I get because I'm interviewing someone else tomorrow and then now my brain is just like with all this negative thoughts what if that person is not that cool like you like what if he's judging or what if he's like what am I doing here if I'm wasting my time what if he doesn't want to take a break what if he you know like this is all just, this is all temporary I used to have my episodes with food long gone just know it'll be long gone you know you'll forget what it felt like yeah. it's here right now just say thank you to it. I had to say thank you to my brain tumor. I had to give it permission. It's like, thank you. You've done your job. Now it's time for you to go. <laughs> but like, sincere gratitude. Just thank you. It's time for you to go. It's time for us to, to move on past this. And you will. It might not be like instant, but you will. I'm not worried about you. I'm not worried about you at all. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I am, but I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> it's it's scary. I guess it's always scary starting something new. It's supposed to be. That's true. A little scary. Me starting something new and it ended up being great. So that's the right path. And if not, then I'll just do something else, right? Why and not? That might be the one thing. Could be. Yep. I've done a lot of different things and you <laughs> find your way. How old are you? 28. 28. You're young. You're good. How old are you? 35. Really? Mm -hmm. I would have not thought that you're 35. I was at 30. Oh, well, that's good. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> try to be healthy. But that's something I don't have. Healthy eating habits. Start there. That has a lot to do with the mind. I know. I'm trying. But I'm not really. But I am. But like. So if you tried a couple of days of um, no sugar. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Sugar, sugar, sugar uh, does a lot to the brain. That's my, even Jake says, he has never seen someone eat as much sugar as I do. I just, I. That's your answer. You got your answer right there. The thing that you won't let go of is your answer. That's it. You got it. It's not complicated. Your program, <laughs> your, your program, your, uh, we are program. And that program enjoys the way it is. I love sugar. I have anxiety. Those are the words coming out of your mouth. Change one of them and watch what happens. You got to run experiments. You can't stay in it 
So um, my manager, she is uh, used to be riddled with anxiety, like riddled, like shy, like mm-hmm. won't look up, won't look, like look down, won't look at people in their eye, won't go outside, won't go to a meeting. She removed gluten and she removed sugar. She got her sugar from sweet potatoes and uh, corn tortillas. Mm-hmm. That's it. Sweet potatoes and corn oh, wow. tortillas. So tacos, which is carbs, which is sugar, you know. Uh, or it converts to sugar, but just a little bit, but a nice, nice, healthy source. Her anxiety went away. I'll put you on the phone with her. You can talk to her. But food healed her anxiety. Wow. Try it. It could. Yeah, because I've always, like my parents have a very sweet tooth, so I've always just not have a, like a healthy eating habit. I eat, sometimes I eat, sometimes I don't, sometimes, and it's usually like, like frozen food or like I don't cook. Mm-hmm. I'm lazy. Um. So it could be. I never cooked either. I met this one gentleman. His name is Angelo Pauling. He's now my health expert guy. He said, Charlie, you're too busy to cook. I know that. I know you're tight. He said, I'll prescribe you a meal plan where you don't have to cook more than 10 minutes every two days. I said, I could do 10 minutes every two days. 10 minutes every two days. That's all, that's all I do. I'm on to your... It's really yeah. simple. It's really simple. I have an Instapot, and I do all my sweet potatoes. I put like six, seven of them in there. And then I do ground turkey, and I do my broccoli, and I season it. It tastes pretty good. Um, you can put a little seasoning, hot sauce or whatever on stuff to make it better. But, like, I keep it clean and simple, and the clarity is unbelievable. And the, the, the sensation you get from being that clean is unbelievable. I say... You're in a place where you're probably really willing to try stuff because you're probably very tired of this. Run an experiment. See what happens. You never know. It won't cost you anything. That's true. It's pretty much free. You're going to eat anyways. Might actually save some money. I don't spend much money on food anymore. I am unemployed now. So So that's a good idea. Well, you just kind of hit the, hit the, what, what would the English saying be? Hit the spot. Hit the nail, nail on the, the head. head. <laughs> <laughs> when you said that, oh my God, I forgot what I was going to say. What was I going to say? Something about sugar? No. <laughs> um, oh, that I'm tired of this. Yeah. Because I've, it's like, it, well, like I was telling you earlier, it was just like, I've always dealt with depression. I'm just exhausted. So maybe it is time to start making some changes. Just overall. That's where change happens. Yeah. When you get so freaking fed up, it's like something's got to change. Yeah. What the answer is, I don't know. But if you run enough experiments, you'll know. But you just got to run experiments. Food is amazing. It can heal so much. If it can heal a brain tumor, and for other people it can heal anxiety, I mean, you don't know what it's going to heal inside of you. You might get aligned in ways that you just don't even know. Food is medicine. And if what you're putting in you is creating an imbalance, what do you, where do you think my brain tumor came from? There's an imbalance in how I ate. I ate like crap. I would eat this processed stuff. Sugar. That's the only thing I craved. I would never binge eat on steak and macaroni and cheese. And No, I needed processed sugar from the gas station to fuel my craving. Why do you think I had a brain tumor? It was an imbalance. When I changed how I ate, I didn't just get my brain tumor shrunk. I experienced miracles. I can manifest like this. It's crazy. I know, but it happens. I say try it. Experiment with getting really clean with the food and see what happens for a week. Okay. I'm really excited. I'm like, okay, I'll start manifesting and things might start coming true. Yeah. (laughs) If it shifts, it'll probably shift within a week, but go really clean. And then it's hard. It's going to be hard. I don't don't know if I'll make it, but I can. Definitely try for a week. What'd you eat today? I ate a banana. That's a good start. A protein shake. Okay. And half pizza of Trader Joe's with like a frozen one. Okay. <laughs> it's all sugar so far. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's my daily basically around there. Okay. 
work on that. YouTube it tonight. You'll have fun. <laughs> You never know. What if it? What if it's the answer and it was just that easy? No, yeah. Like what if? Like 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 let that little like sparkle of like what if exist inside of you? Like what if the, what if it, what if the war is over right now? Yeah. Like what if the war is over, right now? Because you're just one tweak away from it being over. But what if that's the answer? And then you just don't deal with this no more. That's exciting, right? It is. But see, yeah. that's possible. You just got to let that little, like, sparkle fairy dust exist. Mm -hmm. Like, what if, like, this thing is the thing that works forever? And then it's done. And then you get to teach everybody how to do it, too. I'm excited. See? Excitement. That's good. That's what we want. You're doing it with me. Oh, <laughs> All right, now. <laughs> well, I'm feeling a little better. A, a little. Let's, let's not count victory. I'm counting victory. I feel like once I got out of my head. Well, if I like, since I was able to just tell you, and then you know what's going on, mm -hmm. and I can get a little bit out of my head because I was just pretending, like just that I'm fine. I'm faking fine. <laughs> but thank you for being so understanding and nice about it. Of course. No, you've been really cool. <laughs> so thank you. Don't let anybody on the podcast that's not nice. Positive vibes. Mm hmm manifesting perseverance you have a lot of perseverance i have to give you that it's my only gift i have <laughs> perseverance it's the one skill i got <laughs> great skill well thank you thank <laughs> you. you said something it was just about manifesting but i was like like sure but also doing something about it because you can manifest but mm -hmm. but you kept like you kept moving forward and kept going on delusionally that's my secret if you're delusional, you'll try. If you're all smart and strategic, you're probably not going to try anything because you'll find a lot of reasons why it's not going to work because that's how the human brain is. Human brain is supposed to find things that are realistic. The people who do crazy things are unrealistic. So they actually get out of their own way. So for me, if you were to ask me what I was doing the two days before the gentleman walked into my front door, because people would tell me, it's like, Charlie, like, blessings don't just walk in your front door. I'm like, yes, they do. But you got to zoom out. What were the days before looking like? Well, the night before, I was at a meeting with a friend of mine who manages, uh, John Legend. And I told him, introduce me to somebody who knows a lot of filmmakers in L.A. So we're at a restaurant called Gracias Madre in uh, West Hollywood. And I'm sitting down telling him. Look, I'm looking for a videographer to make this fan-made Nike commercial. I'm out there trying. What did he tell me? He told me, Charlie, you need to be more realistic. You need to up your budget. I said, do not tell me to be realistic. I'm going to find this person, and it'll be, like, affordable. There's somebody who can do this. And the day before that, I'm making phone calls. Scott and Michael Ratner, who do, like, the Justin Bieber documentary. I'm like, can you introduce me to a young filmmaker? So the days before the manifestation come true, I'm trying. I'm being told no, but I'm trying. And I wake up the next morning and I write in my notebook, today is the day. I search slash found my videographer slash editor. It's done, exclamation mark. It's easy, exclamation mark. That was my sentence I wrote. Keyword, it's done, it's easy. And today I found, not I'm searching for. Today I found, and he walked in my front door. So it's like the manifestation, you don't know where it's going to come from, but I wake up every day and just try. Yeah, because I guess you have to, like if you're manifesting, you have an open mind about it because that guy could have just walked in, but you could have fully, like completely missed it since mm -hmm. you're not in the right mindset to take that in. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I'll tell you something I'm manifesting right now. So I've made up in my mind that our coconut water company is going to become a sensation in like three weeks. A sensation. Like you'll see it everywhere. Like everybody's talking about it. And so I'm doing the work. I'm reaching out to my friends. I'm sending them a package. I'm asking them, tell your friends, let me get their address. And I'm like messaging them and being excited about it. And I'm going to the boardwalk. And I'm like, I'm going to make this a sensation. 
and something's going to happen. I don't know where it's going to come from because you don't, you can't predict the guy walking in the front door, but maybe it's a Kendall Jenner pops up with it or somebody bought it off of Amazon and they leave a review and it gets like 20 million views on TikTok and it's just sales through the roof. And then somebody calls and they're like, Charlie, send me some. And it might be Kim Kardashian. Like I've, I've created the container. In three weeks, this is going to become a sensation. But that's what I'm manifesting. I'm showing up, I'm doing the work, but I'm expecting something bigger to happen than what I can do. Delusional about it. It takes most drink beverages, you know, two, three years to get big. Mm-hmm. Well. I love that though. I even, I be, the way you talk about it, I believe it. Like, I think it's going to happen. Good. Thank you. <laughs> it's, there's something about your confidence when you're just saying these things that it's like, yeah, like absolutely you're going to make it happen. Do you know what abracadabra means? Uh, poof. Mm-hmm. <laughs> poof. Yes. So it's an Aramic word. It means as I speak, I create. That's the definition. I tell everybody my dreams. I tell everybody what I'm manifesting. I tell everybody what I'm trying to do. Because our words are literally magic. There's only one species on this beautiful planet that can create. I mean, a bird can make a nest. (laughs) A beaver can make a dam. But it's us. Yeah. Tell me how many species can speak. I mean, a bird can repeat something. (laughs) But that's about it. There's only one species that can create. It's us. We just happen to be the one species that knows how to speak. Even in the Bible, they said, first, you know, there was the word, and then everything else followed. Like, it's even in the Bible. Like, it's everywhere. Like, we can speak abracadabra. As I speak, I create. They say, speak it into existence. Speaking is so powerful. That's why I just asked, I was like, what's your dream? Like, it's just so important to just have people speak what they want. But if you can speak in a way that you can believe, like you said, I believe you. I'm speaking as if it's done because I believe it's done. And I believe it's done because when I close my eyes, I can see it. So sometimes all we got to do is just sit down, wait till we see something. Sometimes you can close your eyes and not see anything. Well, how long do you do that? Until you see something. It will come. You'll see a vision, and then you'll know that's what where you're supposed to go. And that's what I do. And then when I see it, I tell everybody. I start moving into action. Create a little game plan. I create a little whiteboard, and I just spring into action. I do my part, but I know that the universe is my business partner. And I know I'm not doing this by myself. And I know some blessing is going to come out of the blue. I'll tell you a story with two chains. So I signed this artist. His name is Titty Boy. And I was like, we got to change the name. So we changed it to Two Chains. <laughs> and uh, true story. <laughs> and I would pass out his CDs every single day. I was the type of manager who was like the street team. Mm-hmm. I was like, I'm going to do it myself. Um, and people would throw the CDs on the ground. Nobody liked Two Chains. And we were getting a little bit of momentum. Just a little bit, but it was like a year had passed and it wasn't really growing. And out of nowhere, we got blessed by the most unexpected thing on planet Earth. It's BET weekend in Atlanta. All the nightclubs are packed. Diddy and T.I. are on stage at the nightclub and they get in an argument with each other. And all the phones came out and everybody's filming this like fight. Like it wasn't like a physical fight, but it was like an argument. And the DJ was trying to get people back to partying, you know, trying to calm everybody down. And so he played this song by Two Chains. Oh. But everybody's cameras are out filming the fight. Fight goes viral on the internet. Everybody's in the comments saying, what's that song? What's that song? Two Chains, Two Chains, Two Chains. Out of here. (laughs) The blessing comes from the least expected place. Wow. It's my job to plant as many seeds as I can every day. And I know somebody's going to accidentally water one of them. That's not my job to water the seed. I just got to make sure I plant them. But there's going to be something out there that blesses them. 
You don't know where it's going to come from, but I believe it's going to happen. That's why I wake up and try every day because I know the blessing's coming. It makes it fun. Like, I know the blessing's coming. Like, it makes it fun to try because I know, like, oh, this is going to be great. Like, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be fun to have all my dreams come true. So let me just go ahead and do it now. It's really good to hear. I mean, I don't know how else to say, but it's really good to hear just everything you're saying because obviously struggling with depression basically you just don't want to wake up because you're not looking forward to it so you just rather sleep all day mm -hmm. but then the way you're saying this and hearing you say this just right here in front of me it, it kind of like makes me excited about life i mean I, 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 right now uh oh I'm, don't get excited now don't you dare get excited <laughs> about life now um, i don't know if tomorrow i'm gonna wake up yes you are now and, yes you like, are i don't know but but it is exciting like is this, how, is this how normal people see life? Like they wake up and they're like. It's not normal. It's what needs to be normal. I wasn't like this. I was a freaking mess. I just got really blessed that I was able to get to this point. And you will too. And then you'll be sitting over here and there's going to be somebody over there. You'll be on somebody's podcast and you'll be helping them. <laughs> You're going to get Let's through it. Manifest. Vision board. I did have a vision board this year. Me too. For the first time. Mine, me too. Really? Okay. I, I've never done a vision board. I cut out the little... On Amazon, there's vision board books. I saw. Yeah. I bought a bunch of them. Yeah. I, I did it on, on Canva because nice. I wanted very specific things. Yes, yeah, so I just put it all together. Nice. But it's pretty cool. Yeah. I feel good. I look at mine every day. You see, I don't, I don't do that. I should probably do that. When you just look at it, be like, this is going to be fun. I look at it, I'm just like, this is going to be so fun. Just wakes up every day. Like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All righty. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you having me on your podcast. It was, it was like, I'm excited. for life. A little. It's weird. I don't know. How, I don't know. <laughs> it's okay to be I'm excited. Like, <laughs> What's this feeling? <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, that, that doesn't happen very often. But right now, this moment, this second, I feel like excited and motivated. Um. Yeah, it's. I guess it's. We just need to spread that message more, which is manifesting and being open minded and just knowing that the universe is not against you. Mm -mm. Although sometimes it really seems like it's just beating mm. you down, but. Or it's just getting you ready for something big. And that's what all the great people have to deal with. You're just one of them. Thank you. Oh, mm -hmm. Yep. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I was going to think I'll keep you, <laughs> I'll keep you posted <laughs> on how everything goes. <laughs> You'll be good. I'm not worried about you. I appreciate it. Okay. We'll do a part two. You'll give me we'll a life update. If I don't die. Stop that. Mm -mm. Uh, Dreams are fun. Thank you so much, Harley. Oh. No, I re like, it really means a lot. That you were just so cool with everything. At this, <laughs> I literally just went to my bathroom and threw up, and then come back. And I'm like, you're just being really cool about it. So thank you. Everybody's different. Each has just comes in a different form, but people also have a lot of proof. People get through their shit, so that's why I'm not worried about it. People get through their shit, and you will too. YouTube tonight, help, uh, food <laughs> and anxiety. You'll, no, you'll I'm actually very. I am very curious to know, like. If it has actually been like one of my, you know, like triggers or like the bad, just anxiety, depression. Cause sure, I, so. Yeah, because I really don't eat what I, like I, I just, it's bad. It causes anxiety. You just Google it. Sugar, yeah. Sugar is really, really, really uh, a trigger. So, all right now.